Good morning, Central family. How are you all this morning? I need to see more smiles. <laughs> all right. Let's be standing this morning. We're going to start praising our Lord this morning with a little bit of the Crowder Hoedown. I saw the light and I'll fly away. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more in darkness, no more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I wonder who's the nameless who comes in. I would. Say hello to those around you this morning, especially this stranger that just got back from 
We're going to continue this morning singing about the goodness of God. How's everybody's week going so far? Good? I hope so. If not, this is the time to chill down. Let the Lord in. He is indeed the king of all of our days. And he is in control 
of all of our days, even if sometimes we don't want to let him have it. He is. So we're going to sing about that now.
All right, kids, at this time you can be dismissed to go on to We Worship and Junior Worship. And you may be seated. As the kids are leaving, we're going to turn towards a time of prayer. A um, couple of things to keep in mind in your prayers this week. Um, keep the Gribble family in your prayers. Um, Ian left for North Korea. Is that correct? South Korea? South Korea. All right. So he headed overseas, so keep him in your prayers and the family. It's always a, a concern. It's always a concern. Um, keep Wayne and Jody Bridges in your, in your prayers, too, as they're going through some difficult times and, and some treatments. So um, just keep them, uplift them, and, and, and pray for the Lord's guidance in their lives this morning. All right. Any others that I don't know about that anybody would like to bring forward this morning? Did you have a successful trip? Good, good, very good. Glad to have you home, safe. <laughs> yes, great. All right, all right. If nothing else, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning, and I'll close. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just are, are so grateful for this life that you give to us, for the freedom that we have in you, Father. We thank you for this family that is here to support us and to fellowship together with us, to worship you together with us. We just thank you, Father, that you are all-seeing, all-knowing, all-hearing, that you are all-powerful that you hear and answer our prayers every day of our lives. We do pray for those prayer requests mentioned this morning that you just would give Ian safety and that uh, you would be with Wayne and Jody and, and Father help the, the doctors to know how to help and, and that they can get back on the right track again, Father. Just ask that you would just continue to be with us, Father. We are so blessed to be in your house. Just thank you, Father, for just loving us. Just, just letting us know that you're there every day. That you are in control. Um, and Father, let us open ourselves to you so that we will let you have control of our lives. Just thank you for that. Be with us this morning as we continue in this time of worship, and it's all for you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our communion song this morning is by his wounds. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him.
Good morning. I praise God for being the greatest storyteller that he is. That is, who has written, directed, and starred in a better drama. The Bible is the script to this story, his story, and I'd like us to look at a couple of important scenes, and yes, the most important scene this morning. The main villain in our story is one God calls the accuser. We know him as Satan. He appears very early in the story, questioning God's character. He tempts Eve by asking, did God really give you everything for a good life? Why doesn't he want you to be as wise as he is? This villain appears again later to question Job's character in chapter one of the book of Job by stating that Job only is committed to God because God has pampered him. Now let's roll forward a couple, two or 3,000 years. We're in the city of Jerusalem where a 12-year-old boy who was said to be the son of a virgin of whom his mother and stepfather were told that he was the Messiah. He sits with the leaders of the temple. His first recorded words found in Luke 2, verse 49 are, why is it you are looking for me? told his parents. Did you not know that I had to be about my father's business? Again, in chapter 9 of Luke, we read, when the time of his being taken up was approaching, he set his face towards Jerusalem. He set his face towards Jerusalem. Jesus knew that the time before his returning to heaven included the big scene. He knew, that, he knew that the Father had sent him to express God's real motive. He knew that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe should be saved. And yes, Jesus did die on that cross to carry our sinful guilt. But he died to bring peace between God and man. May God bless you today as, remember, as we remember his commitment to us and why we're committed to him, why we can be about doing our Father's business. Will you pray with me, please? Father, we're thankful for this time that you've uh, given us. Keep us on track that uh, it's not about what we do, Father. It's what you've done for us. And your motives are pure. That you've, uh, you're the the God that we serve, Father, because uh, you laid down your life for your people. Bless this time. Bless our hearts and minds as we think about uh, your goodness, your forgiveness, and your will for our lives, in Christ's name.
Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We as people, all of us have wants and needs. Our hearts are attracted to the things that we want, and our minds are alerted to the things that we need. Unfortunately, sometimes our hearts and our minds are in a bit of opposition to each other. We uh, sometimes do a little emotional and intellectual battle with ourselves when it comes to investing in our lives and our families. Our needs have to be met, and our wants kind of need to be satisfied too, don't they? If we are honest, we have to admit this. So, first, if we want or need something, we have to prepare, which involves saving our time, abilities, and our money to be able to get these things. Second, we make plans. We need to separate our wants from our needs, our needs from our wants, and hopefully we'll be uh, sensible what we do. And then we hopefully, with prayer, decide uh, to invest, and hopefully there's enough to acquire our goals. Is that ever the case? Do we have enough <laughs> to do the things we want? That doesn't ever happen usually, but we try. Well, it's a fact. We acquire treasure here on earth in this life, and I believe that God wants us to have possessions, but he wants us to lay up our treasures in heaven, not by returning to God what he's asked for, our tithes, but also our offerings, our treasure. Today, invest your treasure in heaven so that you'll want to be there more than you want to be here. Give joyfully unto the Lord, then watch him multiply it. Let's pray. God, thank you for what we have. We thank you for what you give us so freely. Provide for us. We just pray that we indeed do uh, uh, surrender our wills to you and try to be more heavenly minded, invest more in the heavenly things. And we pray that we understand that what we give here today is to do that, to invest in people's lives and to invest in your kingdom. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you Irish? The big day is next Sunday, but never too early to wear green. I like corned beef and cabbage. My family, not so much. My loving wife, though, has even cooked, she's even cooked it for me at times, but it's not her favorite. I usually go to the log cabin. Mike, you want to join me this year? Log cabin, corned beef and cabbage? I went on a road trip this weekend. 
Travis Edmond. We drove on Friday to Orem, Utah. Anybody been to Orem, Utah? Not far from Salt Lake City. I hadn't been there either. Beautiful country. We drove to Orem, Utah on Friday. We picked up a car at the dealership that Linda had, had purchased, Linda Dietz. And we drove back Saturday, about a nine hour, nine-ish hour each way. On the way up, I drove, I rode in the passenger seat of a Ford F-250 pickup, all the room in the world, stretch my legs, mm-mm-mm. Travis didn't even offer that I could drive his pickup home. I drove the car. That was purchased to fit Linda Dietz, not Lyle Heinbaugh. So all the way home, it was not, it was. <laughs> oh. Oh, I forgot about that lever underneath. No, the seat was all the way back. Believe me, brother. It was all the way back, and it was leaned back as well. It was like... <laughs> I survived. It was good, though. Good to be on the road. Good to do a good deed. Good to not make Hal do it. <laughs> And I had to do it because I was talking about kindness today. That seems like a kind thing to do. It was a long way from the palace where he had once lived as the five-year-old son of a prince to the remote barren wasteland of Lodabar. Yet by now, Mephibosheth, that's a fun name, isn't it? Mephibosheth. Remember Mephibosheth in the scripture? If you don't remember him, you're going to remember him this morning. By now, Mephibosheth had grown accustomed to this desolate place, a necessary burden to bear as its obscurity afforded a measure of safety from the political system back in Jerusalem. Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan and the grandson of Saul, the former king of Israel. His father had once been in line for the throne. But all that had gone away on that fateful day when his father, grandfather, and two uncles were killed on Mount Gilbo in a fierce battle with their Philistine arch enemy. Panic had spread among those who lived in the palace of Saul as the news of these deaths arrived. Such a tragedy could mean only one thing. In the transfer of power from the house of Saul to the house of David, everyone expected, according to the custom of that day, of that land, that every person attached to the former regime would be hunted down and killed to prevent any further attempt at regaining power. And though Mephibosheth was probably too young to understand the importance of these things at the time, His nursemaid wasn't. In her haste to leave, she had gathered what she could, and she scooped up that little boy in her arms, and she joined the exodus in progress. And then a very tragic thing happened. The woman slipped, or she tripped, and she dropped that little boy. And though we aren't given a detailed description of the occurrence, the outcome was that Mephibosheth would never again be able to walk. Apparently, those who fled the palace that day got enough ahead of the threat that they were able to bury themselves in obscurity with the hope of never being found. Some years had passed after that. 
Mephibosheth, now an adult, lived in the home of a man named Makir in a remote village called Lodibar. And though the fear of his ever being found by David had probably subsided some by now, little imagination is required to conclude that it never totally went away. So put yourself in Mephibosheth's shoes. Visualize with us Mephibosheth's sudden alarm when one day there was this authoritative on the door of the house where he lived, and upon opening it, he found himself face to face with a delegation of soldiers from the palace who had come to bring him in. And to him, it would seem like certain death. Mephibosheth did not yet know what was behind this sudden occurrence. He he did not know that King David, busy with the affairs of state, had a few days prior suddenly remembered his friendship with Jonathan, Mephibosheth's deceased father. And when the good memories of those days entered the king's mind, it provoked a question, which is recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul so that I could show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? The question brought the summons of a man named Ziba, who had formerly served in the court of Saul, with Ziba standing before him, the king had asked the question again in verse 3, Is there no one remaining of the house of Saul to whom I could show the kindness of God? Ziba, perhaps alarmed a bit himself for being called in before the king, told David about Mephibosheth this remaining crippled son of Jonathan that likely David did not even know about. Bring him in. Bring him in, had been the order of the king. Let's read more from 2 Samuel 9, verse 6. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he said, Here is your servant. Then David said to him, Do not be afraid. A little late, but good to know. Do not be afraid, for I will assuredly show kindness to you for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul, and you yourself shall eat at my table regularly. Again he prostrated himself and said, What is your servant that you should be concerned about a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, Everything that belonged to Saul and to all his house I I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him, and you'll show and you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson will have food to eat. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. What a shocking surprise. What a turn of events. What a surprise that must have been for Mephibosheth. Expecting death. Expecting certain death. Instead, the ownership of his grandfather's land was restored to him and he would have full and regular access to the king and his family. And I tell you that story this morning not to really expound on it much more, really, but to bring up the topic for this message, which is the motive behind David's gesture of goodwill. 
What was his motive? The king had said, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul that I could show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? I believe David was evidencing what Paul would later call the fruit of the Spirit, specifically kindness. Kindness. The Bible says in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. A couple of you told me a little something about last week. Man, that sermon, patience. I had to flesh that out this week. (laughs) Well, hopefully you can flesh out kindness this week. Hopefully all those people that caused you the, the grief and the turmoil that you had to exhibit patience because the preacher just talked about giving and being patient, maybe this week it'll flesh out in in kindness. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit is kindness. That's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to take a closer look at this word and how it relates to us, beginning with a definition. Easy, huh? Definition of kindness. I mean, you would think a person could just go to a dictionary and read a definition and know exactly what kindness is all about, except that, and you can look this up as well, what I found is that this is a word that is not easy to define. It's not an easily defined word. I found a range of meanings and a a, a long bullet list of meanings. It could mean friendliness. It could mean generosity. It could mean sympathy. It could mean warm-heartedness. Or understanding, it could mean tolerance, it could mean agreeability, it could mean benevolence. And so it's not just so easy just to write a definition of of kindness because it means so many different things. Perhaps the most helpful piece of information I found was what the word is often used in conjunction with, and that is being helpful or useful. It's often used in conjunction with being helpful or useful. One who, if you're wondering if you're kind or not, you know, one who extends kindness to another provides, extends, or offers what is useful or helpful or serviceable to them. I heard someone else say once when wrestling with providing a definition for kindness, They said, while kindness may be hard to define, everyone recognizes it when they see it. Think about it. Hard to define, unmistakable when you see it. That's why I told you that story of David's treatment of Mephibosheth. What David did was kindness in action. And if we thought long, hard about it, we could probably come up with quite a list of suggesting things we could do to be kind to someone. But it seems to me that all acts of kindness have one thing in common. They provide something needed or useful to someone maybe less able or perhaps unable to provide for themselves. I think acts of kindness often originate from a basic benevolent attitude of concern for other people. You're just simply concerned for other people, and it comes out in acts of kindness. A kind person is not a selfish person. Maybe you remember the story of the the parable of the Good Samaritan found in Luke chapter 10 and verse 30, where Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he encountered robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by coincidence, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. 
Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed compassion to him. And Jesus said, go and you do the same. Simple, straightforward message. Some were willing to help, some weren't. You be like the one that was. You be like the one that was, even if that person is different than you. In this parable, the Samaritan was certainly unselfish when he extended kindness by stopping to help the man who had been beaten and robbed and left for dead, and he did it at no small risk. He did it at no small expense. It was a risk in that Samaritans were different. And it was expensive because it cost him his own money. The priest and the Levite, on the other hand, while I'm sure they had their reasons or excuses for not stopping, they showed themselves to be motivated primarily with an attitude of self first. Probably in this world, if you have a me first attitude, it probably comes out as comes off as very unkind at times. Maybe you remember the story of the patriarch Joseph in the Old Testament. Maybe you remember the kindness that he showed his brothers who had sold him into slavery and caused much heartache in his life when he forgave them and invited them to come and live in Egypt during the famine. He was kind to his own brothers who who treated him harshly, sold him into slavery, told his dad he was dead. Maybe you remember the Apostle Paul. He was shown, the Scripture says, extraordinary kindness when shipwrecked on the island of Malta as described in Acts 28. It says, when they had been brought safely through, then we found out that the island was called Malta. The natives showed us extraordinary kindness for they kindled a fire and took us all in because of the rain that had started and because of the cold. So again, just quick examples of the Scripture, but again, kindness is hard to define with words. It's hard to write a definition of kindness. But as the illustration after illustration after illustration, it's very easy to see in action. So let's move on to the dimensions of kindness. Kindness is so universally needed that I hesitate to zero in on specific areas lest I leave out others that are equally important, yet for the sake of making application, here are a few areas of concern where kindness is needed. It's needed in our homes. It's needed in our homes. What is it like in your home? What is your home life like? When the front door is closed and the garage door is closed and nobody is there but your family, what's, what's your home like? Are things well-ordered or are things chaotic? Are people pleasant with each other or are they rude? Are they inconsiderate? What was it like even today as you prepared to come to church this morning? Was there kindness in the air? Or was it more like yelling and screaming and griping? What was it like today? What would happen in our homes if we declared a one-day fast or a two-day fast? 
or if you really want to get crazy, a one-week fast, a one-day, a two-day, a one-week reprieve on everything unkind in your home, what would your, what would your home transform to be in a matter of days? You know, the Bible written to Christians says, be kind to one another, compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Again, what would happen in our homes if we applied kindness across the board for one solid day or two days? Somebody has said sometimes it's easier to be kind to a, easier to be kind to a stranger than to members of your own family. I'm sure I'm guilty. I'm I'm sure I've been, you know, a bear at home, but I was really nice to that lady down at the store. Now on Sunday mornings I am kind. I just leave the house before they all get out of bed. Man, I'm kind on Sunday. (laughs) And So I think you would all agree that there is surely a need for kindness in your own home. There's also a great need for kindness within the church family. Church leaders and those who teach others need to be kind. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 24 and 25, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all. So a guy like me is not supposed to be quarrelsome. Leader or teacher in the church is not supposed to be quarrelsome. That's what the Bible says. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, skillful in teaching, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. But it isn't only church leaders who must be kind. The body of Christ must be kind to one another, including their leaders. The Bible says in Hebrews thirteen seventeen, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. It's refreshing to be a leader when our work is not a burden, but it's a joy. For that would be of no benefit to you. There would be no benefit to the body of Christ if the leaders in the body of Christ, it was was a great burden for them to lead. There would be no joy for them, and it wouldn't be of any benefit to the body. So there's a needness for kindness in the home, in the church. There's also a need for kindness among those who are in the world. Kindness is one way God draws men and women to himself. That's what Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and restraint and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Kindness is a powerful tool used by God as a motivator. His kindness leads people to repentance. This kindness that God extends is equally powerful when used by His children. When we are kind to those who do not know God, we are representing the kind of nature that our God is. We are representing the kind nature of God when we're good to others. Kindness is a powerful tool for attracting lost people to God. You want to be a, you know, I have a little book in my office that says people magnet, be a people magnet, become a people magnet church. You want to be a magnet? You want to draw people? You want to draw lost people to God? A magnetic personality. Kindness is a very powerful tool for attracting lost people. 
talked about the definition and dimensions of kindness. Finally, we come to the development of kindness. What can we do to develop more of this fruit of the Spirit called kindness? Well, as has been the case with each of these items on Paul's list, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, each of those, we must first recognize that the presence of God's Spirit in the life of the believer is a key factor in the development of kindness. But we also know that we also have a part in developing the fruit. We are commanded to be kind in Scripture. Again, from Ephesians 4, Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also forgave you. And so it's a commandment that we have a part in it. God's Spirit working in us to make us the men and women that He's called us to be, but we have a part in it as well in doing the things that God tells us to do. And in this context, God tells us to be kind. Kind to one another. We read in Proverbs, Do not let kindness and truth leave you. I like how in the Old Testament it you know, it, it, it emphasizes different things. Well, how are we going to not let kindness leave you? Well, bind it around your neck. Put out some kind of reminder. Write yourself a note if you need to. Be kind. Tie it around your neck. Make it your necktie or your necklace. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Perhaps the greatest thing we can do to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in the development of kindness is to simply remember God's kindness toward us. You know, sometimes we forget how good we have it, or sometimes we forget how bad it was before our Christian lives, and we, we get so far down the road that it's, we just sort of live like we've always been this way. We need to remember God's kindness toward us. Titus chapter 3 says, When the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He richly poured out upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This statement is trustworthy, and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and beneficial for people. Be very careful to engage in good deeds. Be mindful of God's kindness toward you, that you might, in turn, be kind to others. Engage in good deeds because it's God's kindness that caused him to save us. You remember the opening story about Mephibosheth? In essence, we were in the place of Mephibosheth before God showed us his kindness. That, that's how that story relates to us now. We, because of our sin, were alienated from God like Mephibosheth was alienated from the king. We were as far away as we could get from God. We were crippled by our sin. Then God, in His kindness, purchased our salvation at great expense to Himself and literally sent to get us. And He brought us back through the cross of Christ. And then when we decided to obey the gospel by submitting to God in baptism, where we died to our sins, were buried and were raised to walk in newness of life, God then placed us into his family and gave us importance and meaning. And we all sit today around his table with him, his son, his spirit, and all those who have been adopted into his family. And he gives us protection and he gives us hope for the future that we could never have on our own. And guess what? He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to do that. 
We did nothing to deserve it. But it was his kindness. It was his kindness that brought it about. Remembering God's kindness is a great motivator to produce kindness in us. And we need motivation because there is usually some risk in being kind. Do you know that? Risky business. It's risky business. It seems out of place that I'd say that, but it's, it's somewhat of a risk to be kind. In today's culture, kindness is, well, it's sometimes seen as being backwards. Or it's, sometimes it represents a weakness. And if you think about it, weaknesses can be exploited. They always are. Weaknesses can be exploited. And so if you get too obvious in trying to do good to others, you might be ridiculed. You might be laughed at. A person who is too kind at work may be the biggest joke in the break room. In the competitive dog-eat-dog world, kindness can be seen as weakness. But if we do kind things, won't kind things return to us? Isn't that how it's supposed to work? Well, sometimes it happens that way. Sometimes the saying, what goes around comes around, is true. But it not always. Sometimes the person who does right is singled out for ridicule and rejection. Sometimes my good deed to someone turns out bad because of life happens and their treatment back to me isn't good. That's why we need to remember that for Christians, the reward comes later. For Christians, the reward comes later from God who sees everything and misses nothing. See, God is keeping the only record that matters. Yes, there is risk in kindness. There was risk in the kindness that God showed when He sent His Son into the world to save us. While some recognized and appreciated His kindness, did everybody appreciate His kindness? He was nailed to the cross. Not everybody appreciated His kindness. If we're going to be more kind, we're going to have to decide on our motives. What, why, why are we kind? What are our motives to being kind? I'm not standing here before you advocating some kind of do good so others will do good to you philosophy. Rather, I'm saying that Christians need to be kind to others because we know that God has been very kind to us, period. Period. You be kind because God's been kind to you. Period. It's not contingent upon you get the good treatment back. It's contingent upon God being very kind to you. If all we're looking for is an earthly reward in our kindness, we'll probably end up dis disappointed. If we are serving God out of gratitude for His kindness, we'll stay on track regardless of the results. Listen to Jesus on this. But love your enemies and do good. And lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For He Himself is kind. To who? To who? To ungrateful and evil people. He himself is kind to the church people. No, that's what it says. He himself is kind to those that are good back to him. No, that ain't what it says. It says he's kind to the ungrateful and even the evil people. I want to share in closing a story written by a, a doctor, retired doctor, a dead doctor. It's an old illustration. One day, and a long, hot day it had been, 
I met my father on the road to town. I wish you would take this package to the village for me, Jim, he said, hesitating. Now, I was a boy of 12, not fond of work, and was just out of the hayfield where I'd been at work since daybreak. I was tired and dusty and hungry. It was two miles into town. I just wanted to get my supper and to wash and get dressed for singing school. My first impulse was to refuse and to do it harshly, for I was irritated that he should ask after my long day at work. If I did refuse, he would go himself. He was a gentle, patient old man. But something stopped me, one of God's angels, I think. Of course, Father, I will take it, I said heartily, giving my sickle to one of the other men. He gave me the package. Thank you, Jim, he said. I was going myself, but somehow I don't feel very strong today. He walked with me to the road that turned off to the town. As he left, he put his hand on my arm, saying again, Thank you, my son. You have always been a good boy to me, Jim. I hurried into town and home again. When I came near the house, I saw a crowd of farmhands at the door. One of them came to me, the tears rolling down his face. Your father, he said, fell dead as he reached the house. The last words he spoke were the words he spoke to you. I'm an old man now, but I have thanked God over and over again in all the years that have passed since that hour those last words were spoken. Those last words, you have always been a good boy to me. Sometimes the simple acts of kindness we do may be the last we will ever do for someone we love. Think about it. You don't have any control over your tomorrow. You have what you have today. And sometimes the simple acts of kindness we do may be the last we will ever do for someone we love. And if we are living in such a way that kindness is a habit, kindness is a way of life, we will have no regrets when life ends. fruit of the Spirit is kindness. Is it growing in your life? Lord God, we're thankful today that we're able to exhibit kindness. We can, we can see kindness. We can see kindness from your word. Thank you, Lord, for leaving us example after example of what kindness looks like because it's very hard to define. Thank you for the examples that we have in Scripture. I'm thankful for the kindness that I see even in this room. The kindness of people who don't have ulterior motives, they don't have hidden agendas. They're kind because you have been kind to them. And so, God, I pray that we would cultivate this fruit of kindness in our lives. That we would be kind in our homes, that we would be kind in our church, that we would be kind in the world. And this week, as we are kind to those that don't know you, I pray we would do that as a, as a magnet drawing people to the love that you have for us. Thank you so much for the love that we have and the kindness we have that has drawn us to you and the salvation that we have. God, I pray that as you look into our hearts, you would find us about your business of being men and women and children that you called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you be standing, please, as we sing our hymn of invitation? If you have a decision that you need to make this morning and and uh, would like to make that, please come forward as we sing Come Home Running.
know about it. It's right here. You'll know about it if you read it. If you don't read it, you might not know about it, but it's not my fault at that point. <laughs> anyway, notice uh, Easter morning coming up the last Sunday of the month, Easter morning, the time change. If you come at 1030, you've missed everything. So uh, 7 o'clock, we're planning to be outdoors, 8 o'clock indoors for breakfast, 9 o'clock indoor service, uh, no Sunday school, no Sunday evening on March 31st. Uh, volunteers are needed for Easter morning for um, breakfast and serving and cleanup, that sort of thing. There's sign-up sheets out in the foyer for um, the volunteers we need and for some of the food that you could help keep the cost down for that breakfast. So that's, that's coming up, mark your calendars. There's a youth event the weekend before that on March 23rd, the Easter extravaganza. Uh, again, a youth event that's here on this property, but we could use some candy and cookie donations for that. You can uh, read all about that. Um, mark your calendars for March 24th. Um, uh, that's uh, Sunday morning, Pine Haven Christian Children's Ranch will be here. Dan Larson will talk, uh, update us at Sunday school so all the Sunday school classes can uh, come in together for the Pine Haven presentation. Uh, this coming week on Wednesday night, there'll be a second adult class offered if you'd like to check out uh, a creation science-based class led by Kirk Rush. This year's topic, or this week's topic, Light Years, No Problem. That's the title. Next week it'll be a different, it's gonna be seven different topics in the creation science field. So. Uh, this week, if you want to do that, that's in the Seeker classroom on Wednesday night. And finally, uh, there is an eldership and a deacons meeting this Tuesday evening. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Thank you. If you haven't noticed, we got a new guitarist this morning. I appreciate Hans so much. He, he came a, a month or so ago and, and said he was playing guitar now, and I said, that is great. And I said, we'll put you in as a backup guitar for a couple of weeks, get you into it. And, and you know, well, you know, we threw him right in the fire. So <laughs> give Hans a, a... All right. I think he did a great job. All right, let's close this morning with God is so good. through your week this week and have a great one.